Hi, everybody. My name is Harold Strong. I'm president of the Medical Innovation Collaborative here in North Texas. And what you're watching is a series of Medical Innovation Collaborative conversations. This is an opportunity to meet companies that are very innovative, uh, organizations that are in the North Texas region com uh, contributing to the infrastructure as well as service providers to support companies in the area. Today, uh, we are excited to have Ariana, Ariana Mara, uh, if I can get her name, Ariana Myers from Denosi here to talk about Denosi Health and a very innovative uh, program that they have. Howdy, now that I can talk. <laughs> Hi, Harold. Welcome, welcome to our little show here, and we're excited to learn about what you guys are doing, who you are, and all the all the, the details. So just so we know, and to set the ground rules, we have five rules, one or five questions. First question is the origin story. Second is related to who the customer is. Third is what is their unmet need. The fourth question is the gap perceived in the marketplace. And then finally, something fun about yourself. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy, easy peasy. Sound reasonable? Sounds fine. Well, let's talk about the origin story of Denise. Okay, um, so I guess to reintroduce myself, my name is Ariana Myers. I am the VP of Health for Donisi Health. And um, we, are, we are a health technology startup. We've been around for about five years. And uh, our technology really came out of academic research. Um, there was a joint research between Barilan University in Tel Aviv and the University of Valencia in Spain, and that we've done a deep tech transfer from, from that research into the company and, and then carried it out. Um, and where we are right now is then we've refined um, the, the technology, the underlying technology, and um, gotten it into a product which is in final stages of approval with the FDA. Um, and it's new technology. So we took a de novo path with the FDA. Um, really, this is uh, it's 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 not something we've seen before. Uh, I can tell you it's what we're what we're doing is essentially um, optics based. So we have a way of taking uh, a light source, illuminating a surface and um, and kind of from there reading nanometric vibrations on the on that particular surface cool. um so yeah we can we can talk you through it it turns out it's extremely sensitive and um so if you imagine you're illuminating a, a surface um someone's someone's chest wall um it's very sensitive you can do it through clothing you don't have to be illuminating bare skin but wow. if you think about physiologically uh, what's happening inside of that person's body you know the heart's beating the blood's pumping they're breathing right. all of those um physiological movements and even sounds by the way because you know sounds are at their heart of a vibration um we can measure all of those we can detect them and uh to to a degree where we can uh deconvolute what's a really noisy signal into the underlying physiological parameters so we'll go through that a little bit more as we go through the presentation very cool. You know, earlier this week, we've had conversations around the future of health, and this seems right in line with that discussion as we look at, uh, especially in, this, in the light of COVID, we're having to stay home. And even if we need a doctor's appointment, we have to only go a couple at a time and, you know, you're limited. In this scenario, theoretically, you could do a lot of preliminary work with your doctor's office using this particular device. Is that pretty accurate? That's 100% accurate, and you, you've really um, just perfectly described the the kind of scenario, the use case that we see our device being used in. So um, it's contact free. You know, we're, we're you're yeah. not having to put like uh, electrodes on yourself, or right. you don't really have to get it right. You just turn the device on, and it and it finds what it needs, and and um, it's that data. So absolutely, uh, everybody's familiar with doing conferencing with their doctors. I mean, we've all probably experienced it at some yeah. point during COVID yeah. lockdown. Um, but imagine the next step, a future scenario where um, decision support can be made from within the home with mm -hmm. providing a lot more information uh, that, that a doctor would otherwise need to have an in-person and clinic visit with the patient. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Wow. So, so uh, you know, I've heard of other events and other devices that do something very similar, but it's not with light. 
mm -hmm. that seems to be the secret sauce in terms of this particular device. How far mm -hmm. away can I be? And, and does it remember who I am or do, what is that process of the application of the device? How does that work? Sure. Um, so we have um, our, our kind of baseline device is can work from, say, one to two meters away from the person being okay. measured. So we're really envisaging a scenario where you're talking to your doctor and, and it's with you on the table. Sure. Um, but also, you know, um, it can be on your coffee table. You know, it, it can be on your nightstand. Um, if you want to bring up the screen, actually, there's a, oh, yeah. a, a nice picture that sort of describes or, or um, you know, gives a sense of what we're visualizing. So we're really anticipating, you know, people kind of go about their daily uh, routine and if they have a donated device there, then they can be um, passively monitored while they're just going about their business. So that's hence right. the tagline, you know, changing lives without changing lifestyles. Um, as far as uh, down the road, we certainly um, we, we have the capability. Uh, we have some lab models where we're able to be several meters away. Um, and uh, so that's uh, something that we're, we're working on for later versions of, of, of our technology. Okay. All right. So do you want to go through some of the slides or do we want to do that a little later? Yeah, let me go through some of the slides because was your second question customer needs? <laughs> It, it was, but I'm a little excited about this slide deck. So, let, okay, I'll ask the question: What are the needs of the customer? So. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me uh, let me um, give a little bit of a backdrop. I think probably most of the people in in the audience here are going to be very familiar with uh, some of these big picture drivers. You know, we've got um, a, a rapidly aging population in the Western world. And um, that's that's led to a bunch of other uh, ramifications in, in the healthcare world, right? So we we know that we have um, a, a shortage of caregivers from all the way from from MDs, you know, RNs, all the way down to your non medical uh, caregivers. Um, there's there's just a, a looming shortage. Um, I think the uh, AMC said 100,000 doctor shortfall by 2030, or uh, something like 200,000. Uh, per annum short in RNs, um, and the same thing happens on the on the kind of CNA and and um, just family caregiver level. So with that, um, it's been understood for a long time that um, there, these these are pressures on the healthcare system, and that technology is going to have to be part of the solution. Everyone needs to be more efficient in the way that healthcare is delivered, and. Right. Um, so this, it's been understood for a while. There's going to be a shift from um, treatment in a, uh, you know, in a dedicated facility, a clinical setting or an acute setting to the extent that 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 uh, treatment can be delivered at home. Then this is this is kind of something that happened big picture wise. But of course, with the covid lockdown, oh, yeah. um, that's been a catalyst right for this right. just unprecedented increase right. in um telehealth and right. uh and and you know consultations and basically you know those um interactions that can take place remotely are um certainly encouraged to do that right. so we're kind of functioning in in that bigger picture um if you think about what i've said about our device the fact that it's it is contact free and we're not going to have to um you don't need a professional uh medical professional positioning the device on you so you're able to operate it from home and we're very, very focused on that. We're very focused on making uh, it easy to use. And that's going to help solve some of these adherence issues that we have um, with, with using the device at home, right? The less that you need to actively do yourself, then the better off you're going to be. Of course. Um, so, and then I just want to kind of indicate, you know, we are at the heart of it measuring vibrations. And so um, that means that our real strength is in... Um, cardiac and pulmonary monitoring uh, because these are physical movements that result in vibrations on on the surface of your skin so right. um, that's where really where our focus is and um, that means that we're really looking at um, we're, we're in line with the uh, demographic shift from the silver tsunami um, and that, because we can an anticipate obviously an increase in chronic conditions that are um, really well suited you know chronic care management is is an area that's very well suited to uh from home got it 
Got it. Excellent. Okay. Um, so, and what I want to really um, indicate is that uh, specifically, here's a situation where we're making amazing progress that we don't see anyone else able to do. This is this is something that's unique and um, a kind of uh, artifact of of how sensitive our measurements are. So I'm, I said before that we're able to, um, to to measure vibrations, and that means that sounds even um, very, um, a very, you know, small sounds of, of small changes of the lungs are something that we can pick up. And, um, so where we, where we are right now is we find that we've got the ability to detect pulmonary congestion, which is an early indication of a heart failure, um, episode. So, Heart failure is a is very intractable intractable problem right now in healthcare. Um, the readmission rates are huge. There's mm -hmm. we, uh, some someone's been discharged from a heart failure incident. They have a twenty percent chance of being readmitted within a thirty day window, um, and and that goes up to fifty percent when you look at one hundred and eighty days. And these are extremely expensive readmissions um, and cost you know costly to the to the payers, but. Um, you know, not not nice for the patient either if there are a way to prevent it. And right now, uh, the standard of care is is to go home and, and weigh yourself every day and look for a change of a couple of pounds that you weren't expecting. And, you know, that's that's a sign of edema in your system means your heart's failing. Well, if you're at the point where you already have um, fluid collecting in your system, then you're pretty much not able to to intervene uh, with with medication. Um, the person is really well on their way to a readmission. So, um, if you can um, find a way to to uh, detect that early, then you've got a, a real solution coming. Um, right now, there are some. Um, ways of monitoring for heart failure decompensation at home, but they really take the the, the form of these um, surgically implanted devices uh, that are looking for changes in, in pressure. Um, there are there's a kind of uncomfortable looking, uh, very expensive uh, wearable vest um, that is, um, as I understand, not necessarily working too well. Um, and then vo voice based software watch um, but um, that's uh, th that's uh, that's still kind of in a state of development so what we are showing then is um, we are able to, to to kind of hear the congestion uh, at a point where even a cardiologist who is auscultating with a stethoscope uh, would not be able to hear it um, and so if you can imagine then a scenario where the person is at home and um, they take a measurement once a day, well, once every other day. Um, once those crackles are are detectable, then uh, the the physician can um, make med medication changes, so increase the Lasix or whatever the you know the protocol happens to be. And um, it's it's a real opportunity for uh, intervention on in a timely manner to prevent a readmission. Okay. So, um, so that's what we do. We um, we have the device. Uh, it, it takes a measurement. It, um, it you know it sends it up to the cloud. And and the pulmonary congestion isn't the only thing that we can measure. We actually are able to monitor several other parameters in and around cardiovascular health. So we're not kind of a one trick pony. And what I think is pretty exciting as well is that um, if you think about what we're doing, you know, we're collecting a raw signal that um, is full of information that, and it's really a matter of, are we going to be able to uh, find the information that's that's hidden in the signal? Um, but that means that going forward, there's a possibility of detecting other parameters that are going to lead to other um, decision support and diagnostics in the home, which is, which is uh, pretty okay. powerful, I think. Okay. Um, okay. So, where are we in our in our questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that that's interesting, but but in terms of the product, who are you selling the product to? Is this sold to a doctor and then the doctor gives it to the patient, or is the patient purchasing this to let the doctor know I have this information? Here's how I can send it to you. How what's mm -hmm. that transaction like? 
Sure. So um, we're actually pursuing a couple of different pathways. Um, we are uh, ready with the FDA with um, a heart rate and respiration rate. So these other bio, bio parameters that I've mentioned are um, we're, we're achieving quite a good clinical um, yeah. medical grade accuracy, good. but we have haven't done the formal um submission with the FDA. So that's a process that we're going to have to go through uh, moving forward. And um, that's going to include conducting some clinical trials. So if we stop for a moment with what we have, um, we are working in, in a wellness parameter. And that would be um, a situation where, where someone actually purchases a, purchases a device. We're actually working directly with uh, non-medical home care agencies. Okay. Uh, so they have this need where they the family wants to see increased health monitoring in the home but they don't you know want to have the extra cost of a of a medical visit to do that so we can fill that gap okay. um and in the meantime then we're going to be taking things forward um with the fda process for um all of these more sophisticated algorithms that they kind of layer on top of the device right. so the device gets approved and then you have um, more and more complex algorithms that are that go through the FDA separately. Software right. is a medical device. Right. Yeah, right. right. So, so clearly, uh, assisted living senior facilities would be ideal product, uh, ideal for this type of a product. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we're really where we are. Our our, our sweet spot is is in home use. Yes. Um, and so we're really anticipating that that we would be home with with someone and and kind of helping them age in place okay. um the and so we but 100 there's certainly a, um, a valid use case for any kind of structured senior community like an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility um because the device can can do those vitals measurements that care staff are having to do you know individual by individual this would be a way to kind of um, speed up that process for for the the um, the ales and the sniffs. Uh, so um, we're kind of going in incrementally. We're working with the home care agencies. Um, we're looking for partners to do uh, proof of concept trials with, um, and specifically, we're very interested in working with uh, post acute facilities. So sniffs, where somebody is say on their way home from the hospital post a post heart failure inc mm -hmm. incident mm -hmm. and then would like to be um, part of that transition to home uh, landscape. Um, and in that case, then, you know, this would be uh, under a Medicare reimbursable right. device or part of a value based payment, right. um, uh, you know, managed care situation. In terms of development of, of the tool, um, are you are you in, in your trials? Are you collecting data sets to build? a deeper, richer source of data, or are you pretty comfortable in that space right now? So we have a base of um, more than 1,500 uh, clinical patients um, that have participated in various trials. And uh, that's pretty good, but um, data is is very powerful for what. So I kind mm -hmm. of mentioned the possibility of of doing uh, machine learning, and and you really need significant volumes of data to yes. do that. Um, so, so that's a kind of, um, any, you know, whatever we're doing, we're always adding to our, our database of information that we can right. use to train further algorithms. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so the, the whole HIPAA component is addressed, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work in this scenario? Because so the data that's being projected to the physician is, mm -hmm. uh, enclosed in that data stream. So unless you're tapping that data stream, you're not going to have access to it. But how do you um, engage data security HIPAA requirements in this process at a high level? Uh, so at a high level, absolutely. Uh, we're, we're well aware of HIPAA requirements. And uh, so we have a um, you know, a secure feed from, from the device into the cloud, um, a secure cloud. And then we would work through um, APIs that meet all the kind of expectation and around uh you know protocols and um uh and standards yeah. uh so we're, we're designing everything to be able to interface with electronic record um 
uh, systems right. in different in different situations. Right, and then when you say uh, 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 health records, they are different in many situations. So being able to flexibly adapt to that particular client is, is going to be uh, the, the challenge. Did, did I see in your slide deck that this is uh, a portfolio of 39 technologies, patents that are included in this technology, or did I misread that? It seems like it's pretty robust. It's the technology is, is highly patent protected. So, um, yeah, I think, and I think this, this, uh, we now have 27 registered patents. So this, oh, wow. it, it, it creeps okay. up every, every now and then we in uh, 15 patent families. Uh, right. so the IP is pretty well protected. And yeah. like I said, it is, you know, this was a de novo, um, process as far as, as far as Wonderful. the FDA is concerned. Wonderful. I, I think you answered all my questions in four or five very succinct slides. Uh, I don't know if that's cheating, but it's very thorough. Thanks for sharing that. Pictures worth a thousand words, yes, right? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, so uh, that leads us to: um, Do you want to give us a little story about how you found uh, Denosi or or Denisi? Sure. I always put the extra O in there. I apologize. Yeah, for that. But Denisi. Do you wanna, Denisi there, means means vibration in Greek. By the way, that's that, that's where the name came from. Very helpful. Very helpful. You Thank you. Um, How'd you meet him? Yeah, so I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, and you know, when you're when you work in a startup, and I know you encountered this, you, you more often than not find non-traditional <laughs> career pathways that people have followed, right. um, almost by definition, right? To to wind right. up in a startup. So um, if we go, go back to my my former. Incarnation. I um, actually had a full and as an investment banker, um, you know, and I was in London and I did some private equity and and um, uh, but what happened with me was a kind of um, just a realization that um, what I was getting out of it uh, wasn't sufficient for me, just in terms of personal satisfaction and a sense of right. mission, and all that right. stuff. And so um, I, I had a, it was a it was a long, slow process. But ultimately, I, I wound up realizing that I needed to do something completely different. I didn't really know what that was. Um, I began a kind of personal quest, which, uh, you know, it took the form of climbing mountains. You know, it's a I mean, the aim not for something literal, higher, go not, for the air. Not clear. But literally, literally. Uh, yeah, I was I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro. So that was the tallest in Africa. And um, and then I thought, OK, well, let me try tallest in Europe is called El Bruce. And it's, it's actually on the Russian border, Georgia. And uh, and then, you know, my third mountain was the tallest in South America. And uh, that was where I met someone who was very influential on me, but but gave me this understanding that, hey, maybe this person worked with startups. And I thought, this is great. This is what I need. I want to build something. And I wound up moving uh, wholesale, you know, from Europe back to to the Bay Area. So that's where I am now in the North okay. Bay uh, of San Francisco. And okay. um, and uh, just uh, pretty quickly, uh, I started looking around. I, I was working with startups. and um, But then I understood this whole situation situation with the silver tsunami and that was probably years ago um everybody really gets it now i think it wasn't that well understood but i was fortunate to be um to to, to be dealing with an expert who who really knew that part of it right. so i wound up um working w since then i've been working in and around longevity uh, and startups um since that time uh so that included um building my own home care agency i'm a pretty hands-on person um wow. and uh yeah so i got you know i was trained as a cna um i've kind of done all of that piece of it um and from there uh i actually went almost the opposite direction i was really interested in um neurodegeneration and so I joined a lab doing research in biology of aging and I was actually in an Alzheimer's research lab for a couple of years wow. um, yeah so uh, this is what I said about non-traditional career path um, <laughs> and uh, I and I found Donisi through um, a colleague uh, in the Bay Area and um, really uh, I just immediately understood you know, I'm very aware of the loon caregiver crisis, and I really understood the power this technology has to be disruptive in that space. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I was in. I'm here now. <laughs> uh, 
uh, so automation. I have friends who have parents who are in senior facilities, assisted living, mm -hmm. and due to the COVID lockdown, they can't see their parents. And unfortunately, a lot of caregivers are going to, um, you know, do checkups, and many of them may be spreading the COVID virus within these facilities. So the thing that most interested me about Denise and the product is that this removes some of that risk once it's up and running, assuming these people engage um, and, and use this for uh, the, the, the uh, people in their, in their spaces. So that was really interesting. And obviously with your background, you can kind of see from a financial perspective, the impact it could make. But of course, the training that you did with you know assisted living and and alzheimer's and all that which is tremendous congratulations on that so yeah, i can see your value here that's that's exciting that's fun yeah i, I you're 100 right about um infection control i mean it, it's it's one of those we used to have to explain why contact free was a good idea but no nobody asks asks us that question anymore right. um right. so for cool. sure it, yeah cool. absolutely there, you know the, the infection control angle is there yeah. um and and I think for us then and the ease of use just by being contact free. Absolutely, absolutely. So so because this uh, startup stuff is pretty much a twenty four seven three hundred and seventy day a year job. Uh, you don't have a lot of time to climb mountains now. So what do you do now to relieve stress and to just kind of let the, the the brain rest? Oh my goodness. Um, well, yeah, I have a. a a, a three mile loop that I do pretty much every day around my neighborhood. It's got a little yeah. profile, but you're right. It's nothing, it's nothing like a real mountain. Um, yeah. yeah, but I am the mother of a, a toddler. So that's also, <laughs> that's enough. That's enough. That'll keep you active. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been a fun conversation. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm excited about the product. And, and what we hope is that we can introduce you and this idea to a host of different folks to, Kind of get some engagement and participation especially in the areas that you need it so um with that i want to thank you for your time thank you so much i appreciate the opportunity and it's it's been a great conversation thank you it, it's been fun so um i will pop up your um website again so mm -hmm. that uh, folks can go and get a, a longer look and a better idea and your information is on the website uh, if you like, I can put up my um, slide that has my Please do. Let me do that quick. Oops, that's got my CEO's contact info on it. Sorry about that. It's just Ariana um, dot Myers at donisihealth.com. Okay, cool. Well, uh, Ariana, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we reserve the right to check back in a few months to see how things are going. Yeah, I hope you know we have some exciting news to share with you. That'd be fun. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for being a part of our conversation today. Uh, we will be back with more MIC conversations in the near future. Thanks.